So reflecting the here and now, Pachubana Tama. It's remembering, isn't it? This is what I'm doing now is remembering, using memory to reflect on the way it is. So these words like here and now, Pachubana Tama is just a way of informing consciousness of the way it is. It's not a defining or describing anything but a pointing. So this is a this is the, how the Buddha teaches. It's not doctrine, definitions, <clears throat> but about pointing here and now. The Four Noble Truths here and now, this suffering, its causes, cessation and path, is about here and now. <clears throat> Where we use language for thinking uh, and analyzing, comparing, criticizing, evaluating, uh, you know, and uh, comparing one thing with another. So that's, that's generally how we're culturally conditioned to, to use our thinking process as a critical function. And then we, we don't, we're, we're not informed on how to use thinking or the thinking process or memory in a way that leads to liberation, freedom from delusion. So our thinking tends to create more delusions. <coughs> the, like the Sakaya Ditti personality view is an illusion. <clears throat> that we, most people are firmly committed to uh, and operate from this, uh, this perception of I'm this body, this person. These qualities and on and on like that. And in the cultural conditioning, the values and principles of my culture, of my group, my religion, uh, the thinking process then is is a description, defining, uh, comparing, evaluating, and just notice that the, when we use this word dualistic, the, uh, that thinking is a dualistic function. Its purpose, its what it does to consciousness is divide and separate. To so you have, you know, whatever thought you have, it has its opposite. So when we, you know, the Buddha pointing, emphasizing mindfulness, which is not about thinking or choosing uh, an object to become, but to uh, remember the reality of now, here and now, Pachubana Dhamma. The posture now, the breathing now, the the state of mind, the mood, the emotional state you're in, the uh, whatever conditions that you that you have at this moment that are operating through your consciousness. Mindfulness, sati sampachanya, allows us to observe, to be the knower of the conditions rather than the owner, the person that has these problems, the person that is limited, bound by what you're feeling or the physical body or the um, prejudices, biases that you might be, you know, your culture, your conditioning might uh, manifest in the present moment. So it's, this is not, a, a, you know, like a, an attack on conditions. It's not, because that would be another condition. You know, we were saying all conditions, we're looking at them as in terms of characteristics of impermanence and not self, rather than as good or bad. Condition phenomena can 
you know, has its range of the best to the worst, right and wrong. But awareness of conditions. And if we couldn't be aware of conditions, then we would be helpless victims of our conditioning. There'd be no escape from the born, the created, the form that originated. We'd be stuck with the package that we kind of acquired through circumstances or whatever. <clears throat> But because there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, there is an escape from the born, the created, the form, the condition. Now, this particular teaching then is is a reflective one. It's not not for grasping and and uh, you know to make anything out of it, but to reflect from it. It's a reminder, like Pachubana Dhamma. He's not saying this moment is the best moment or uh, comparing it with memories of previous moments. It's just the reminding, awaken, be fully here, present, here and now. And then people ask me, how do you do that? <laughs> and I say, I can't describe how you can be mindful, it's just ah. <laughs> so then the, the Ajahn Amaro, Ajahn Pasano, the the book they wrote, and it's been in the process of being printed, a publication called The Island, and it's now received copies. Hopefully, uh, we'll receive more copies. We, uh, they sent just a few. But this is, uh, this is Ajahn Amaro, that's very much uh, consulting me. I wrote a f preface for it, and it's, it's about this. The island is a metaphor <clears throat> and it's, uh, you know, you use this, the metaphor is, is for reflection. It's a kind of taking a symbol for something. And so this, this metaphor of the island, that which you can't go beyond, so the, the, the you know an island is say in the middle of the ocean. It's the shore that has no shore beyond it. It's uh, the place of here and now. You know you can't. Wherever you go, this is this is the point you're operating from. From this island, set in all the sea. So apply that to the here and now, reality of here and now just this, this metaphor of the island. And I've contemplated this for many years because this, uh, I like doing this. I have a natural inclination toward this kind of reflectiveness. And uh, there's um, years ago when I, I had only about three vasas. I was at Tham Sang Pet, which is a, uh, was my favorite monastery in Thailand at the time. It's now in the uh, I'm not to learn, but it was um, a place I really liked. And I did a lot of uh, this kind of reflection, had a lot of insight during the two years that I lived in this place. And I was reading uh, William James's uh, book, Varieties of Religious Experience, which is a kind of classic uh, of, um, you know, William James was a philosopher, English philosopher of the 19th century. So, and he wrote this book, Varieties of Religious Experience, and at the very end of it was this quote by uh, Swinburne, 
a poet. And it's this, 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 uh, and it was at the very end of the, of this book, Varieties of Religious Experience. And, and that struck me at the time as being, you know, something to reflect from, because this was, this was the insight I was having, the shore, the shore that has no shore beyond it. Like the island, you can't, wherever you go, you're, you're the, the, this island itself, there's no other shore. So mindfulness then is uh, this ability, you know, this, where we put ourselves in that center point on the island. We say, for example, we are, you are the island. You can't get beyond it. Set in all the sea, everything, so the rest, of, all around you is the sea or the world. Where on a personal level, uh, your personality works. The Sakya Ditti is about I'm this person sitting here and I want to go there and if I go to India and sit under the Bodhi tree I'll get enlightened or I've got to go to Thailand or uh, go to the Himalayas, uh, live in a cave or find the right teacher or there's always this sense of me uh, as a separate entity that has to find something, has to get something I don't have or find a, the right place, or the right person, or whatever. So the, that the Sakya Ditti is, is a very conditioned illusion that uh, if we don't break through it, if we don't get beyond it, then we're this kind of like the flying Dutchman, a hopeless wanderer in the, in the world, forever searching for, for our partner, our mate, our perfect situation, seeking, you know, can't die, forever stuck in immortal physical form that can't die, and just wandering around the samsara. That's how, that's the image I have of, of uh, ignorant human individual lost in the samsara, going from one lifetime to another. Uh, you know, just looking, searching, trying to find himself or herself, trying to find the right place. But this is, uh, the Buddha's pointing to here in now Dhamma, it's not something that you, you know, you, you have to go looking for, it's a matter of awakening to it. This awakening then is reminding here and now So it's a, like remembering. The Four Noble Truths is about here and now. It's not about me trying to analyze why I suffer, what's the cause of my suffering, uh, who is the creator of suffering, and, and thinking of it from the Sakya Ditti level. It's about there is suffering, it should be understood, there are the causes, they should be let go of, the, there is a cessation should be realized, there is the path it should be cultivated. So in the Sutta Nipata, they also quote this, because this is one of my favorite verses, was the, the island that you cannot go beyond. Well, contemplate this during this retreat, this, this metaphor of the island. It's a place of nothingness. So you, you give up trying to find something. It's, you know, you, you, you can't get beyond it, so that, that sense of searching and looking and desiring and trying to, trying to change things according to your likes and dislikes. You can begin to see that. You have, it's like you suddenly switch from being this, this kind of lost, wandering person into this awareness itself.
being this awareness. And then in uh, T.S. Eliot, uh, from the Dry Salvages, Men's Curiosity Searches Past and Future and Things to That Dimension. So it's like curiosity, isn't it? What is curiosity? You know, that's always looking, being curious, trying to find something. Something over there, I'm interested in, in that, because I'm curious, so I go over there. <clears throat> over here, somewhere else, but searches the past and the future and clings to that dimension. So this is a statement of, of ignorance, isn't it? It's curiosity, man's curiosity, caught in time, the hopeless, wandering, lost soul in the sangsara, <clears throat> searching for himself. <clears throat> and then apprehend the point of intersection between the timeless and time. And that's mindfulness, isn't it? The point of intersection between the timeless and time. It's not about past or future, and clinging to perceptions of, in the future, I'll get something, I'll become an enlightened person, or I'll, I'll have insight, or the, the past, clinging to memories of the past. So I always liked that, the point of intersection. Apprehend, the, the word apprehend, the English word apprehend is a good word yes, to recognize here and now. Apprehend the point of intersection of the timeless with time. And so this is like the, the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. And then there is escape from the born, the created, the form, the conditioned. Because there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. Well, what is that right now? Is that just, you can just uh, memorize the words. But the reality of it is uh, here and now, isn't it? Awakened, the individual being awake. Mindful. <clears throat> from the point, uh, from the shore that has no shore beyond it. So each one of us is, is you know, in this term, in terms of the existential reality of this moment, is this island. You know, this is, this is a metaphor for <clears throat> Being born in a form, having a human body that has its span of time to live. It has a past, it has a future. The future is death. The past was birth. <clears throat> and from this, this point, because each, you know, when we identify with the body, then it's a sep we always have this feeling of separation. You know, vulnerability. I'm this vulnerable human body. I'm this, the age of this body. I'm a male or female. I'm, a, you know, then it goes into the whole proliferating uh, identities with conditioned phenomena. And, and this is what society, uh, imposes and believes in and, and reinforces these delusions of a separate self, <clears throat> a separate soul, right and wrong, good and bad. And so awakening is this imminent 
reality of here and now. It's just this. So it's not a destruction of the personality, but it's, it's uh, transcending the personality. So we're not trying to, to destroy our personalities, because then that would be dualistic again. Personality is bad, we should get rid of it. But it's not about getting rid, it's, it's understanding, apprehend, to be able to see Sakya Ditti as an object from this point of consciousness in the vast universe that we're engaged in at this very moment. <laughs> so each one of us is, uh, has this, you know, is this island. We have to experience this whole universal system from this point of here and now within the restrictions of the human bodies we have. We'll contemplate that, what that really means, you know, whether it's a healthy body or unhealthy, young or old, male or female, <coughs> fat or thin, tall or short, black or white. It's this point, it's a conscious point of consciousness. The body was born and and that, in that birth of the human body, it becomes, uh, it's a conscious form, the point of consciousness in the universe. So it has a sense of separation. And then we, we are conditioned to, to identify with the body. With, uh, we develop our personalities, our, our values, our principles, our fears and desires. And then with awakened awareness, with con then consciousness is no longer, we're not projecting conditions into it or operating from, dis from perceptions of me and mine and cultural attitudes and the thinking process, but from pure conscious awareness without distortion of the conditions that we, that we can easily uh, grasp if we're not aware. So in the, in the Ajahn, Pasno Ajahn Amaro's book, The Island, this is a, a kind of, it's very good actually, a kind of, exploration of this, this metaphor, and using quotes from the scriptures from Lung Po Chan. Because this is, uh, this is, this is what, well, how we learn, we can learn from these metaphors, but not uh, kind of analyzing or, you know, getting caught up in mythology or anything, but using them for you know, applying it to the here and now, like taking refuge in Buddha, Bhutang Sarananga Chami. You know, that, that can be just, uh, uh, you know, part of Theravada Buddhism, Buddhist ceremony, and is a, we request the refuges and the precepts, and then the monk says, Bhutang Sarananga Chami, and the people repeat it ceremonial. <clears throat> but then, you know, internalizing that, it's not just, you know, believing in some kind of abstract Buddha or in perceptions of Buddha because this will always make Buddha seem something separate, like it's, it's a historical sage or it's a kind of force that we can imagine, a kind of Buddha nature out there. You know, so we can, we can abstract it and create all kinds of theories about Buddha nature or the Buddha within or the Buddha throughout the universe and Buddha energy and Buddha mind and, and proliferate endlessly around 
the word Buddha or just never really think about it. Just repeat like a parrot, Bhutang Sarnangachami. But these three refuges have great significance in practice because this is what I call internalizing them. So that they're not just traditional recitations in Pali words. Actually, what is Bhuta, Bhutang Sarnangachami at this very moment? Taking refuge in Buddha. And this is like, this is a self-inquiry. What is Buddha at this very moment from this island, this point of consciousness? And of course, it is a convention like any other word. But for me, this, when, when I think of Bhutto or Bhutang Sarnangachami, it reminds me of Waken, here and now, Pachubhanatamma, the knower, the ability to apprehend the point of intersection between the timeless and time. This is like refuge in Buddha. It's not speculating or me, my personality, uh, kind of claiming to be Buddha at all, but it's it's merely using this, these words for remembering mindfulness, Pachubhanantama, here and now. <laughs> so the mantra Bhutto is, is, is not a matter of attachment. It's not just to, to use it as a kind of uh, chant mantra, but it's actually internalizing it. So it, it, it's a reminder, it's remembering, sati sampachanya, remembering the present moment. Because if we don't recall or recollect or apprehend this present moment, then we do live in, in this uh, curiosity, the past and the future. And we cling to that dimension. We believe in the future and in the past. Hopes for the future, enlightenment in the future, success in the future. Or maybe it's all going to be the other way. Failure, old age, pain, misery, loss, depression about the future or the past. We, people have regrets about the past or resentments about uh, things happening to them in the past that you remember. Or we have, you know, if you, you have happy memories, so one can remember the good old days when I was young, the happy days when life was sunshine and roses. And now old, lonely old man. <laughs> but my youth, I was really somebody when I was young, but now. <laughs> so one, you know, old people sometimes, they always live, they can uh, go back and tell you endlessly about their past, their youth. Clinging to that dimension of the past or the future but to apprehend the point of intersection of the timeless with time is an occupation of the same. But then it goes on into not an occupation either, but a lifetime in self-surrender, selflessness. Ardor he uses. So it's not just a kind of, you know, resignation passive, negative resignation to the present. It's an awakened, vital ardor of awake attention. Mindfulness, sati sampachanya, sati panya. Panya is not some passive blankness. It's, it's discerning, it's, it's uh, full, it's effulgent, radiant. <clears throat> but when we get caught in the past and the future, then 
we lose that. You know, we get, we, we cloud over our radiant nature is, is lost into regrets or longings or fears, dreads, hopes, expectations, worries, all the things that the self, the sense of the, the, the binding ourselves to these conditions, you know, we're lost in this dull world of conditioned phenomena. It makes us dull and stupid. <clears throat> So during this, uh, you know, emphasizing this opportunity of this community retreat, and that's why too, to be silent and and uh, look inward, you know, so that you you're reminding yourself when we go out and endlessly seek distraction uh, through talking to others or computers and laptops and getting caught up into duties and responsibilities, then, then our personality easily uh, takes over. You know, the Sakya Ditti Silabhata Bhāramāsa Vichikicca tend to uh, reinforces those uh, fetters. And we forget, you know, Pachubana Dhamma, because, you know, the world, the sangsar is about, you know, doing this now for a result in the future, planning the future. <clears throat> Remembering the past. And the present is just merely, you know, an unnoticed. Or if it is noticed, it's merely, you know, from the self-view. You know, I'm here and now, I like this place and I don't like this place, or I'm happy now, and, but, uh, or unhappy, so that, so that the present moment even uh, gets corrupted into some kind of personal uh, view, evaluation, judgment, distortion. So see, these, these conditions, like they distort consciousness. We're seeing you know, we look through distortions. Through these, you know, if you go to these fun fairs, the things of these, the, I remember as a child going to these fun fairs where they have these room of mirrors where they, ha they distort your form. <laughs> so you go from one mirror to the other and your, your body takes on kind of ridiculous shapes. And so, and that's what, what happens, isn't it? We, when we're ignorant, not awake, then we, we live in this realm of distorted, grotesque images that we, we identify with. <clears throat> and then we lose ourselves in these, in these uh, distortions. And then, of course, we're frightened and anxious and worried and want things we don't have and don't want what we have, and discontentment, dukkha, the first noble truth, suffering, loneliness, despair, Shelley's uh, poem, when Adonais starts with uh, peace, peace, he is not dead, he does not sleep, he has awakened from the dream of life. He has awakened from the dream of life. It is we who lost in mortal visions keep with phantoms and 
impossible strife, an idmad trance, strike with our spirit's knife in vulnerable nothings. We decay like corpses in a charnel. Fear and grief possess us and consume us day by day, and cold hopes swarm like worms within our living clay. <laughs> Awakening from the dream of life, from the dream that <clears throat> the, the attachment, blind attachment to condition. So this is like a vicha, bhajaya, sankara, sankara, bhajaya, vinyana. So like Paticca Samupada, you know. A vicha, not knowing dhamma, ignorance in other words. So a vicha means ignorance of the truth, of ultimate reality. It means not knowing the unborn, uncreated, unconditioned, where we're just helplessly caught in the born, the created, the form, the condition. That's avicca. You know, so avicca affects everything around us. When we come from avicca, from sakya ditti, from sila bhattabharamasa, from wichikicca, when we operate from these fetters and, and create the world from these distortions, then, then the avita affects all sankharas, our whole experience of life. How we see the universe, ourselves, and the world around us is, is through ignorance. And then, of course, that affects this conscious moment because we're conscious entities in each one we're experiencing pure consciousness at this moment but with this avicca if that's our modus operandi that's what we operate from then then that affects consciousness in everything we do you know whether it's sitting standing walking lying down breathing <clears throat> monks or nuns you know young or old whatever everything is uh, then affected by ignorance. And it always ends up at the end, soka parite watuka tomanasa upayasa, grief, sorrow, despair, and anguish. So this is like paticca samupada, or dependent origination. You know, if a vita, then that effect, then that is the cause of dukkha, of suffering. <coughs> So that avicca, then we, we I, my personality, me and mine, my body, what I look like, my position, my feelings, my principles, my desires, my life, my memories, my future, my past, everything operates. Is, is, if, if I don't see avicca, if I have no perspective, no view, if I don't have that perspective, if I operate always from a vicha, then the result is always going to be dukkha. So that's summarizing Paticca Samupada. <clears throat> because if you take that, avicha bhajya sankara sankara bhajya vinyana vinyana bhajya nama rupa salayatana uh, Patsavedana and so forth. It follows that whole sequence of uh, operating from avicca leads to, is the cause or the result is dukkha. And then the, uh, the, uh, the other side, the neurota side, once avicca, there's no avicca, extirpate avicca, Deracinate and extirpate avicca. 
Through what? Through, <laughs> through awareness. Awakenness. It's as simple as that. It's not, you have to study, uh, get a PhD in Buddhist studies to extirpate a vicha. <clears throat> but it's uh, awakening here and now. So this, uh, from this point of intersection between the timeless and time, then the perspective, you ha you, 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 you're not um, destroying conditions, but you're extirpating avicca. You've conquered ignorance, and you're, oh, there's awakened puto, seeing Dhamma rather than me and my problems and my views and principles and my life and so forth. So this is like Buddha Dhamma Sangha, this, uh, these three refuges, I think they're very skillful uh, words because it helps to, to put you into that state of where your personality can be seen, not judged, where the Sakya Ditti, Sila Bhattabharamasa can be observed. Puto is the knowing. It's apprehending, ability to apprehend this moment, the point of intersection of the timeless with time. Then what does the Buddha know? He knows the Dhamma. Ultimate truth, reality, is awakened to reality, to the truth. And then the Sangha <clears throat> is not a person. In fact, the word always conveys a sense of a community or group of people. But it's about Supatipano, Ujupatipano, Yaya Patipano, Samiji Patipano. This is not about, am I a good meditator or not? Am I practicing in the right way? But it's, it's through this, this uh, insight that supatipano, that the individual, each one of us then is, is supatipano when we're aware, when there's awareness and wisdom. Ujupatipano, direct, it's direct, clear, here and now. Insightful, samiji patipano, yaya patipano, samiji patipano, integrity, the sense of knowing from your guts. This is a knowing, and it's a it's a profound knowing. It's not theoretical knowing. It's not conditioned knowing. So this is the gift of our human state, is that it is a, this is a opportunity we have to, uh, for liberation at this very moment. Where sometimes Buddhism gets so heavy with, with uh, views and opinions and and, uh, you know, this weighs you down with all the information about Buddhism. Now there's so much information in so many different languages about Buddhism. And then the internet and then websites, Buddhist websites, everything. Is, there's so much information that it, it makes Buddhism look you know, like a very complicated, uh, almost impossible religion. Or is it a philosophy? People ask me. No, it's not a religion, it's philosophy. No, it's psychology. No, it's... <laughs> but if you really take this, it's, it's, you know, the Dhamma is not about, it's not a religion or a philosophy or psychology. It includes all those, you know, so you, you can, you know, it, 
this this teaching is both you know it's it can be seen as philosophy or psychology or science religion because it's about the way it is it it's not uh, kind of put into a category of something or other, like religion and science. In the West, isn't it, they tend to separate religion and then there's science. Religion is all about believing in deities and hocus pocus and that kind of thing, mumbo jumbo. In the last retreat, somebody wrote me a letter about mumbo jumbo, hocus pocus. That's how <laughs> That's how they, like, they would we do the chanting, you know, and we, and we, the kayena vachaya vacheta, we all put our heads onto the floor. The, this person, hocus pocus, mumbo jumbo. That's how they see it. Because they see it from a particular point of view, you know, and, uh, and then we can, you know, if we're engaged, if we're committed to this tradition, then we can also be blinded by our own tradition. You know, if we're not practicing, if we're not supatipano, then we become Theravadan Buddhists, and, and then as we identify with Theravada, then we, <clears throat> we form opinions about other religions, other forms of Buddhism. So it's, it's not about, you know, grasping convention and aligning yourself with a convention out of ignorance. Sakya ditti sila patrabhara masa vichikita about using, it's a tool for use, it's an expedient means. It's a very skillful tool, but if you use it wrongly, then it's, it's not the tool's fault, is it? <clears throat> so, you know, the, the see the, the directness of this, you know, it does, it is threatening in many ways because the self is being, you know, it's like, it can be rather terrifying because if I don't have a self and I don't, who am I, you know, and we, we can become emotionally quite frightened by emptiness or the, uh, the idea of complete surrender. And, uh, it, and from the Sakyaditi level, this is a big threat. You know, I have to surrender everything. I have to give up everything. I have to let go of everything. I, 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 have, to, I have to examine the Four Noble Truths and I have to practice. And so we can take all these uh, skillful means from the Sakyaditi level, and where does it take you? You know, it becomes compulsive, uh, be becomes part of, you know, a sense of ourself. We, if we don't practice from uh, enough, or then we, or we doubt about our practice, maybe I'm practicing I'm not practicing right. Tell me, Ajahn Sameto, how to practice rightly. Because I don't know, you know, I'm afraid I'm making a mistake and I'm doing it all wrong. Could you tell me how to practice rightly? Practice in the right way. You guide me, Ajahn Sameto, and tell me what to do. And then I'll, you know, then I can, I'll tr I trust you. But everyone who says they trust me inevitably don't in the long run. <laughs> because, it, you know, it's coming from Sakya Ditti and seeing me through Sakya Ditti, seeing themselves through Sakya Ditti, the self view. So it's not pointing to, to, to anything other than the here and now, Pachubana Dhamma. Wake up. I can't wake up for you. I can't even tell you how to wake up. It's just something you do. <laughs> so the, the, the uh, invitation to wake up is, uh, 
you know, it's not something that one can make someone else do or even describe. So these images like the island, the metaphor, <coughs> these are, you know, these are, use them for the here and now, you know, just get a feeling for being the center, you know, because this is not Sakyaditi anymore, not saying I, Ajahn Sumedho, am the center of the whole universe. It's not megalomania. But it's, uh, it's about examining this present moment because right now, in terms of experience at this very moment, this point of consciousness that, that I'm experiencing through this form that's sitting here on this high seat, this is the island, this is the center point and the rest is the, all the sea around it, you know, all the waves, the fish, the, uh, everything that, that is in the sea around this island. And then that, that metaphor is you can't, there's no point in searching or trying to find any other place, but recognize, to apprehend this, this is it. This is the island. This is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. This, this. Stops the thinking mind. You, you try to think about it, you, 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 can't, you, know, you, you just get more and more confused. Like Ajahn Shah would say, your brain will explode. Trying to figure that out with the, with the dualistic thought. So this is where it's, uh, it's this uh, imminent, awakened, realizing, apprehending this point of intersection of the timeless with time. And then it is about a lifetime, the living through the lifetime of these forms, their aging process, their, their death, the things that happen to us individually or as a group, you know, the good, the bad, praise, blame, success, failure. <clears throat> a lifetime of selflessness, surrender, and ardor. I like that word ardor, isn't it? Because it, self-surrender and Selflessness can sound very passive, you know, just kind of lying down and letting the world go by in a kind of passive resignation, waiting to die kind of thing, <laughs> sitting around waiting to die. Or ardor is this, you know, this, uh, this, is, this has energy, this, ha this is bright, radiant, not just selflessness and surrender, but ardor also. So this, this in the, within these forms, these separate human forms, then, and, and then there's these excellent tools that we have, the Buddha gave us, we have a way to, to examine our experience of, and to, to know reality, to be the knower of reality rather than somebody who's searching for God or reality or truth and through some idea of it. Always with the basic uh, distortion of a self, the crazy distorted mirror in the amusement park, in the fun house. <laughs> 